It is really a distinct honor for me to be asked to introduce my colleague, Stacy Rasmus. Um, and Dr. Rasmus will be uh, presenting on upstream efforts and on work by Alaska Native communities uh, upstream prevention of suicide. Um, Stacy, uh, over to you. Thank you, Jim. Um, my name is Stacy Rasmus. I am the director of our Center for Alaska Native Health Research. It's within the Institute of Arctic Biology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I also hold a joint appointment as a research director in the Center for Health at the Northwest Indian College, where I lead projects addressing the opioid and drug overdose public health crisis um, through strengths-based strategies in Coast Salish communities, where I'm originally from. Here in Alaska, though, where I've lived for the past 20 years, uh, I've been partnering with Alaska Native communities to in the development of solutions to end suicide um, for young people. And, and unfortunately, um, I wasn't I wasn't uh, supposed to begin our presentation. We um, typically always have our elder, um, our colleague and project leader, Mr. Billy Charles, um, open us in a good way to speak about this, um, this very beautiful work that's happening in Yupik, Alaska Native communities um, to build strengths, to promote life, uh, to, to connect young people with elders and, um, and and the protective factors. Billy usually begins us, and he wasn't able to attend today as there's healing work to be done in this family. But he wanted me to share. He he told me, Stacy, open open with one Yupik word. You must pr put one Yupik word out, and that word is Koyana. And Koyana is thank you. He extends his thanks for being asked to come and present as part of this webinar. He thanks the organizers. He thanks our wonderful keynote speaker, Dr. Gan, and we thank all the other presenters um, for the work that, that we are all doing in this extraordinarily important effort um, to bring about equity in our communities and to create those reasons for life for young people. So I want, oh, second. I want to extend my respect and my thanks to the elders, um, to all the elders and the indigenous lands rights holders uh, who here in Fairbanks are the Dana people of the Tanana River. I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Jerry Mohat. He's in this photo here. Uh, Jerry was the founding director of, of CANR, the center, uh, Center for Alaska of Health Research that I now lead. Um, he came and presented in 1999 down at the Northwest Indian College, where I had I was teaching and currently had no plans of really, I had plans to go on for my PhD, didn't have plans to come to Alaska, but then Jerry provided a presentation on a new project that he and Dr. Allen, Jim Allen, who's my longtime mentor, colleague and friend as well, had, um, had recently been awarded from the National Institutes of Health, a project called the People Awakening Project. And it was focused uh, on looking at pathways to Alaska Native sobriety. It, and, and Jerry really emphasized how this was a research project that would look at the strengths, look at what was going, what, what was working, what was, what was creating wellness for Alaska Native people. Um, and I was, I was so taken with the strengths-based perspective that I came to UAF in 2000 to do my PhD and have been here ever since. And then um, also acknowledging these um, are two of the founding elders of the intervention that we'll be describing today and showcasing um, that began an intervention that began in communities on the lower Yukon River. And so for those unfamiliar with Alaska, oh, well, before I get to that, actually, so I, I want to start with a summary of what I hope will be your takeaways, where first we want to emphasize that it is critical that we recognize the ancestral strengths of Alaska Native people and, and cultures, along with the imperilment of Indigenous Alaskan communities through forced disconnection from sources of strength and structural oppression that liter very literally broke up homes and families in fragmented communities. But then we want to showcase and lift up 
a collective effort in Yupik Alaska Native communities to really redefine the problem of suicide as a collective harm, a sign of spiritual vulnerability and disruption. We will describe the Kanazovic, the Tools for Life intervention, that utilizes an indigenous theory-driven Kazakh model encircling approach um, that, again, employs indigenous knowledge and theory-driven um, interventions to address young and in young people, suicide and substance misuse, but to address it within systems, within the social and cultural system, spiritual and ecological system. It really moves, it moves us upstream and works with young people, all young people in the community. It's a universal approach um, to build these protective factors early on. Um, and it really shifts the focus from individual risk to building those community and cultural strengths. And we'll provide a wonderful showcase um, for you from a community where you'll be able to see in real time how the protective factors are being built. Um, and finally, I will ask my mentor and colleague, Jim Allen, to describe how research um, and our Western science has been adapted um, by by our Yupik community partners to complement and underscore what is already already ancestrally known and proven that cultural factors are, are prevention and preventative. So for those unfamiliar with Alaska, um, it is very, very large. <laughs> so we have some very unique features for trying to uh, deliver services across a state that, again, is, is as you can see, is one-third the size of the contiguous United States. Um, and across the state, we have upwards of 200,000 tribal members across 258 federally recognized tribes. And Alaska is very large. It's very geographically, culturally, and linguistically diverse. Um, and, and again, there's, um, within the, the diversity, there is something very shared though, and that is, um, the ancestrally and inherited, uh, strengths and the resiliencies. And we want to emphasize that, you know, the, the living and growing up within culture or indigenous ways of being is protective for children and that alcohol and other drugs and, and suicide among young people was unheard of um, in Alaska Native communities and cultures. Um, and just this is to provide more context, we're going to be talking about Yupik Alaska Native communities today. And as you'll see, the, the big red dots are where we have active interventions um, taking place. And again, this region is, is large um, and completely off the road system. Um, there's, um, there's a central hub in Bethel and... Um, yeah, and there's local option laws, there's, there's strategies that are in place, but really, you know, we haven't seen, unfortunately, the kinds of change that we would like to, to address um, the, the absolutely unacceptable uh, inequities and disparities that we see in this region and all across Alaska. And unfortunately, across as we've seen from other presentations, um, other indigenous communities across our nation. But in the region where we're working, it has among the highest rates of suicide among young people. And, and, and our, uh, unfortunately, again, it's the highest rates are among young people, 15 to 24 years old, and um, also impacting young or deaths by suicide um, impact young men most highly. And alcohol is often um, involved in suicides and uh, and so is considered, you know, part of the the, the problem of young people um, succumbing to to these risks. And so, well, briefly, and this is typically again where Billy Charles would come in and much more elegantly describe the the foundational model of the the Kanazovic intervention, the Tools for Life intervention, is guided by this. Kazakh model process, which is an indigenous understanding of, of what led to the suicide disparities and then presents solutions for what can end um, suicide among young people. And so 
the the Kazakh in Yupik communities was it was um, it was a noun. It was an actual place. It was a men's house. It was the central. It was a central communal living space for Yupik communities um, during the long winter months when um, there was more permanent settlements over the winter. And but the, within the, and within the Kazakh, all things healing, education, um, instruction, um, building tools, everything happened in the Kazakh. Um, and again, it really served as that organizing, centralizing place and way of coming together or, and to build strength. And it, it, it ensured, it ensured structurally um, equity, um, health equity, where everyone got had access to care and was taken care of. Um, and also the Kazakh, Kazakh can be used as a verb um, and can mean encircling and coming around and coming together. And this is just an example of what happened when forced imposed change where uh, Alaskan people became imperiled through the forced imposed changes in colonization, where you can see the transitions in, in actually that last um, photo of the aerial shot of the Kazakh was taken from um, uh, historic photos from the, this 1928 set of photos. Um, and then you can, this is of Hooper Bay, and this is one of our intervention communities. And unfortunately, one of the communities in the, that Yukon Kuskong region, the Yupik region, that has the highest rate of suicide um, in the region uh, or, or um, historically has. And as you can see, you know, you can see the physical translate transition of space um, and the decentering where over you know this you know there's here's a church and school and the community and this is night uh, 2016 and, and it's kind of hard to see but you know the, the community is also um uh grown six times um from what it was and so the the Kazakh model approach understands the problem of suicide as uh, a collective uh, as a collective harm, as stated. And so, uh, and it's something that from within the community, the solutions must come. And the communities have come together and and recognize again that, you know, okay, we've, we've become all fragmented, you know, and, and there's all, also this imposed way of governing and healing, you know, through these new systems like nonprofit health corporations and IHS and the BIA for education and tribal governments even. It's just different from the way that we used to um, be as a people and take care of each other. So we need to recenter ourselves around that traditional way of taking care. And in doing that, we need to be building the protective factors and strengths. That's the way we're reducing risk. We're talking about reasons for life. We're giving people reasons for life. Um, as we've heard earlier too in other presentations that, you know, there's that real shift of the narrative and the language and words really matter. And we need to talk about life and not just wanting our young people to stop dying we want them to want to live and so we want to build those protective factors and we'll do that by by creating um experiences protective experiences through activities for young people that connect them to their culture and to their um to the elders and knowledge bearers and so they're learning the survival skills they're learning their value they're learning their purpose they're learning their their connection and meaning in life um and every community has a kazakh as billy says so yes this is a very this is a yupik culturally grounded model but what grounds this model can be found in any indigenous community or any community of people and you know we don't have a lot of time here i see so i want to be able to shift to jim um so i'm going to you know you'll I just want to show you how the intervention works. As I said, it begins with that community mobilizing process before we do any activities with young people. Um, and we're doing baselines at that time with young people while the community is coming together, identifying the activities, identifying the protective factors. And then, and then we start the work with young people and get young people over about a two-year process um, engaged in many, many different activities and out on the land. And here's one community. That, these are photos from over the pandemic. This community was able to continue their intervention during the pandemic because of all the outdoor and land-based work um, and the need for more subsistence foods when the planes stopped flying and young know, people were really exposed to how important their contribution is to their communities during this time, gathering wood for elders, getting their first catches, giving their first catches away, um, gathering 
essential foods like mouse foods, um, setting net, building the tools for life. Um, this, and Jim might mention more about that walking stick IRA and how symbolic and important that is. And through this, really, young people are gaining their healthy connections to their past, understanding that at the, at the root of it, as I said earlier, was, was strength in their ancestors, and that those strengths are still there. And we're just, we just need to bring them back forward and make them central in young people's lives. These are images from the other communities participating in the work. Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for that excellent introduction to the work. Um, I, I want to emphasize uh, the university researchers did not design this intervention. The communities did. And uh, there is a role for Western science, uh, I think, in documenting the process by which this works, how effective it is. And in addition, I think there's much to learn for other communities in the United States from how this works happens. I'm just going to talk briefly for two or three minutes and jump through some of these slides about uh, some of the things we've learned about how do you study the intervention effects of a suicide prevention intervention that's upstream, never mentions the word suicide in its work, and focuses on something completely different. These are two activities. These are on the uh, individual level, meaning uh, they work with young people alone. Many of the activities the communities uh, develop involve families or involve the entire community. Um, I want to focus on the top left photo, if you can see it. That young man um, is learning, uh, is, is on one of the activities, um, learning how to navigate ice on the Yukon River. Um, every year someone dies when they fall through the ice, and it's because uh, the traditional teachings of how you were safe in the ice were not shared effectively. And um, this, uh, this activity or module, as we call when we write it up, is um, a nice illustration of what we study and um, how the intervention works. Each module promotes a protective factor. I'll just focus on one. The Yupik word is shlanik, uh, literally to wake up. It's an awareness of interconnection. It's awareness of when you are aware of your environment, you become aware of your impact on the environment. Others in your environment, uh, you're more connected. The, the uh, relationship in terms of protection from suicide, the relationship about why you wouldn't misuse alcohol becomes um, really apparent quite quickly. And, and in fact, um, I think this is very important. It underlines a key concept. Uh, we're using English. We're using a scientific term, protective factors. The elders, when they talk about it, describe it as conurete, which might literally be translated as the teachings. These are not activities like outward bound just to get on the land and to go outside because that's healthy, which they are. Um, this was a complete system. This was a system of education. This was a system by which young people learned to grow up to be healthy adults. Next slide, please. Um, we've learned a number of things that we can study protective factors. Um, very important thing, we had to develop our measures. They needed to be culturally distinct. We found measures uh, from other populations typically did not work well. And uh, what we are doing is documenting through the intervention growth in protective factors hypothesized to function as buffers from suicide risk. Next slide, please. Um, uh, Chukyan is a Yupik word for measuring. And this is really what the process is about. These are a number of the measures we use. And we, um, we use youth surveys. We're moving into adult surveys. And 
um, they really explore different areas of growth in young people through the course of a participation in the Kungasovic intervention. Next slide, please. Um, this is um, some of our earlier work. It's a comparative effectiveness study. It's just a summary of a much more complex model, time by community under reasons for life means that in contrast to a low dose intervention in one community, higher sufficient dose in the, in the second community produce large changes in the young people and, and an effect. And we often show this to communities in this way. Um, the, this is a, um, um, a, 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 the salmon which is an important subsistence food and in, for the Yupik. And it just shows growth and protection in response to dose or the number of sessions or teachings young people attend. And uh, we can share with community members this way their intervention was effective. Um, I'm just going to close. Um, this is a summary of the summer findings. Um, I wish I could present to you. We have recently concluded an analysis of a four community um, clinical trial of this intervention. And this is currently in tribal review. And I look, we all look forward to sharing it with you. Um, in July. I, I, we can share. We're very happy with the results and we're excited to the prospect of sharing with you. And uh, again, I want to emphasize and close with this was a community solution. Um, this was something the elders have thought about very hard for a long time. And I think an important role for scientists is really can we document this and um, there, there are tremendous things that I think are worthy of sharing for all populations, all people that come out of this work. Back over to you, Stacy. And I'll just say, I'll just end with Koyana. Thank you. Oh, and this is our, our acknowledgement, of course, Koyana to our funders as well through this. Again, it's been over 20 years of, of partnership and support. So Koyana. Koyana, Stacy. Um, I'm going to, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I'm going to um, um, ask uh, the, uh, the question I asked the other two presenters. And, uh, and that's uh, related to a primary question uh, guiding this workshop series. Um, what can change the trajectory of indigenous suicide? And uh, there are, of course, many barriers. Um, you. The communities have adopted a strengths-based approach. So in keeping with that, um, what change do you think could move uptake of the Kungasovic approach to other communities in Alaska uh, who might want to use it or in the lower 48 United States? What, what can we advocate for? Well, I think we, we need to be advocating, mm, demanding equity. We need to have equity and health equity for Indigenous, American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian communities. Um, and we need to, to demand that equity um, and consideration from our health services agencies from um, and from funding agencies as as well. And I, I, I think I mean, one of some of the barriers that at least we've experienced, Jim, I know you're familiar with this, um, is we are often asked the question about about uptake or um, like translatability of this model, how how can this model like work for anyone else? And I always get a little stumped by that question because it never seems to be asked the other way where, as we heard from Dr. Gan's presentation, these, the evidence-based practices and suicide interventions that we have right now have, I, I would say for the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of them have been um, developed with non-Indigenous peoples and, and communities, but then they're being, yes, and they're being wonderfully and um, creatively adopted by Indigenous communities, but why cannot evidence-based proven practices that come from Indigenous communities, 
why can they not work or be adopted in non-Indigenous settings? Um, and in fact, uh, we, we are, another project and effort we have within the Center for Alaska and Health Research is our, unfortunately, our military population right here in Fairbanks has experienced large clusterings of suicide over the last five years and are just very, are, are very much in need of approaches and have come forward. And, and we, we've begun this beautiful translational work to look at, at what are some of the elements, those, the functional elements of what works um, when, when communities take this on and, and truly implement it to their, to the cultural ways, how does it work? What are those elements? How can in other contexts, like a military culture and community, how could those work? And we're finding that they, they, they most likely can. And um, we're certainly seeing that translational aspect. So I think that's another hurdle, Jim, that could potentially move us forward is for, for is that recognition um, that, you know, despite our small numbers, like, you know, that we matter. It is about that every young person. So I really appreciated the comment and around the zero suicide that one is, is too many and one is enough. You know, we're changing one life. Why is that not enough? And it needs to be. So um, I don't know. I just wanted to jump in. I was listening to you speak and, uh, and uh, talking about uh, the military and the experience in the military coming to the center uh, for assistance. I was thinking of what Billy always says mm -hmm. and would say if we were, if he was here today, uh, he would insist every community has a Kossiak, which of course means every community has a communal structure and a way of protecting its, uh, its community members. And it has, it has its own way of working and it's, it has been effective. And uh, um, the, the message I think seems to be, we need to respect that, we need to locate that and we need to support that and, and the way it transpires in that community. Um, there is a question that came in and uh, I think it's a, it's a, a plug, uh, Stacy, for uh, your center or, and um, it, it asks, is there a way to have access to newest published research for suicide and substance use disorders from those that do this important work in Indian country? How do we get these results? Yeah. The <laughs> Well, I can certainly send uh, a publications. Yes, we have a centralized kind of resource. Um, actually, it's through our um, it's through our Alaska Native Collaborative Hub for our research on resilience. We have a publication resource that you know we attempt to, to centralize um, um, publication in that area. Jim, were you thinking of other? I, I was just thinking this is such a good question as um, it, that <clears throat> that is an excellent resource for people. But um, I, I think it's it's something uh, the scientific community can be much better at is how yeah. we disseminate our findings. And uh, um, unfortunately, they're primarily in journal scientific journal articles, which are generally incomprehensible to most people. And uh, I, I think we really do need to do better in our reporting and reporting in a, in a way that communities can use this information. I think that's uh, an, an, an important change I would like to see in how we as scientists work. Um, and uh, um, I am looking at the time yeah, and- I think uh, we're, I think we need to uh, uh, relinquish the chair to our next presenter at this moment. So uh, thank you again, uh, Stacy Rasmus. That was wonderful.